Hello and welcome to the Finally Quit Porn Podcast. Today I'm joined by Sean Russell, the sub-editor and writer at The Times, and we're going to have a conversation talking about pornography. So welcome on the episode, Sean. Um, welcome on the podcast, Sean. As I was just saying <laughs> to you before, I'm really tired today, but uh, really looking forward <laughs> to talking with you. So yeah, welcome on. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'm uh, looking forward to talking about this uh, this topic, which landed me on the front cover of the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really amazing to to sort of talk to you because, you know, like, about a month or two ago, basically, um, actually, it was probably only a few weeks ago, my mum said to me that one of her friends had, like, told her about this, the magazine, and, you know, she'd seen you on the front cover and had read it and thought, oh, yeah, that sounds a bit like you. I'm quite open, so I told my mum all about this myself. And, yeah, um, <laughs> she found it quite interesting, and it was a really good read. And, yeah, she shared this uh, magazine with me as well. And... I just thought, wow, that's that's so relatable. You know, as I was just saying to you, so many things in this story, I really was like, oh, yeah, that was just really similar to how, how I was growing up. Um, so, yeah, how did you end up, like, writing this? Like, the, the, <laughs> how did that come about? Yeah, um, I think I, I sort of uh, had this idea that I wanted to write a little bit more about men which I think is such a sort of a big topic these days. And um, and I'd never really seen this topic covered in a way that I related to it. I think there's a, a way to sort of, a lot of the articles that are around porn and things like this that sort of end up being quite hysterical. So you either talk about the really extremes where it's incredibly violent or um, you know porn websites that are doing sort of really unsundry things um or on the sort of the porn addiction level and I never really felt like I fit into either of those camps and that actually maybe I had this kind of quite quote unquote normal um experience of porn um and so when I was given the opportunity I was speaking to one of the editors at the, at the Times magazine uh, Nicola Gill and she wanted me to sort of put down that side of things um as best I could um and in the end, it's sort of, as much as those other topics I'd like to say um, are incredibly important, dealing with porn addiction, dealing with the dangers of porn, there's a lot of things around that. The thing I wanted to go into was how it affected me and how I think it affected a lot of my friends. And and, and as you we were saying before, I really was happy that you said that you related to it and you feel like your friends might relate to it as well because uh, when you put those stories down, you think that I think they're funny because uh, they are funny to me now, maybe less so at the time. Um, and after speaking to friends, I suddenly realized that these stories are just so universal. Uh, and I was like, okay, that sort of gave me enough confidence to say, let's put these somewhat embarrassing story. I'm not going to sit here and, you know, say I'm necessarily proud of these things, um, but they happened. They're true. They happened. And so, when I was given the opportunity to write about that, I wanted to take that. And um, I had no idea it would end up being the cover story, but here we are. Yeah, amazing. Well, I'm sure it took a, a bit of courage to to decide to like write this and that you was going to, you know, put this out to the world. Had you like spoke about much of the stuff you wrote about with anyone else before? Yeah, I think mostly mates and and, and male friends predominantly. Uh, I think it's I don't know about yourself but I've never been a particularly like shy person of this stuff um, and it's like it probably for, especially when I was in sort of my late teens it sort of formed the backbone of our kind of like it was just like my mates just taking the piss out of each other um, and that sort of uh, to this day I mean we're now all 30 and we still make these same jokes we were making when we were 16 and like um, so I don't know if I necessarily spoke about, uh, I think I, in, in the article, I talk about one of my experiences at, at university where I couldn't get it up, essentially. Essentially, that's exactly what it was. And um, I don't think I would have spoken about that until much later on, and by which point I kind of didn't care anymore. And that became a funny story to me. But at the time, it definitely wasn't. Um, it was like, a, oh, God, <laughs> like this should be an easy functional thing. And, you know, um but then yeah as i as i sort of in more recent years i've definitely spoken about that with people and, and it's and now you laugh about it and then 
one of the things about this article actually is after it came out pretty much everyone and it came up to me with their stories and, and i found that kind of quite nice in a way they'd usually come up to you and be like oh it's really brave i can't believe you did that followed by here's a tale of me <laughs> getting into some kind of uh, situation with porn or, or women or whatever uh which i really liked i i think it sort of clearly was relatable and that was a lot of um I take a lot of sort of joy from that in the end. Yeah, yeah. I think sharing these kind of experiences is so valuable because I remember when I was like 16 and yeah, the first time with a girl, you know, I really like this girl. She's in my French class. She comes around. I'm a little bit nervous. I don't really know what I'm doing. And yeah, I couldn't get it up. You know, that was my first mm. time. Just full of like anxiety. And mm. honestly, th things worked out because, you know, like I think maybe the next time um, it was fine. And, you know, we had sex and she ended up becoming my girlfriend for a few years and whatnot. Yeah. But yeah, like that first time I did not tell anyone about that. You know, yeah. like me and my mates would have all of this, like all these like jokes and like a lot of banter just around like dating and things like that when we're that age. But actually admitting to anybody that yeah like that first mm. time I couldn't get hard that back then was so difficult I mean I'd, I'd come on a camera and happily talk about that now or with yeah. my friends now and yeah as, as you say you kind of look back on it and it's like quite funny but I think maybe the problem lies within like the way in which people don't always come out and talk about these problems and then when they do as you were kind of saying earlier it can kind of come from quite a extreme perspective rather than mm. what that's a little bit more balanced and a bit more like oh well this happens you know maybe there's a reason for that let's try and mm. sort of solve that problem a little bit but let's not sort of approach it too too hard on and I think that was my problem for a number of years is I was trying to quit porn but I was putting a lot of pressure on myself and found it really mm -hmm. difficult because I did go and consume a lot of content that was quite extreme and not very balanced and was like, you need yeah. to quit porn. Otherwise, you know, you're never going to get an erection ever again in your life. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, well, yeah. that's not really the reality, is it? So no, I, no, I think I remember having a very similar reaction. I mean, nowadays I'm not kind of, um, I, I do still watch porn, as I say in the article and stuff. I, I'm, I never, I, I mean, I don't consider quitting it now. But certainly when I was, you know, 16 through the university years, that was, I think it was a normal reaction. You kind of, if you have a situation like you just explained, which, uh, you know, where you feel like, yeah, you're never going to get a hard on ever again. And I think that's a kind of, that was exactly what, how I felt at the time. It's like, oh God, I can't do it this time. And I'm never going to be able to do it. And it's like, and that was the first time I came across that term uh, performance anxiety, which I wrote about in the article as well. Um, and my first reaction was quit, quit this completely, um, which I definitely did have periods of doing that. Um, and then you do find that that helps. I mean, it definitely helps. I mean, I, I, but I think like you say, it's actually coming to it with a reasoned response to it and kind of realizing that porn is different to sex and that takes time, that takes time, that takes experience. But I think, as you said, there's like, with the articles that you read and the things you read about porn are so hysterical, you can start to feel shameful about it. And then you start to feel like, oh, this is this whole thing's wrong. And then that just adds another level of pressure on top. And um, that's where I kind of was hoping to write something that was more kind of just honest um, and not, you know, every sexual experience you're going to have is going to be amazing. It's not even with, with or without porn, you know, <laughs> porn just doesn't help that. Um, and so that I, I felt, and I, I referenced the in between us, for example, in the article and feel like that's kind of what I was trying to do with this article is make poke fun at myself, show a reality and be like, you know, it's not all horrific and you can come out the other side as totally as normal as you can be um and so i'm kind of glad that that really came across in the article as well yeah yeah and i think what you said there about shame is absolutely so true i think a lot of the content that i consumed kind of made me feel like a bit of a failure like a bit of an idiot for ever mm -hmm. looking at porn at all and i think it is really hard to to quit porn <clears throat> you know it is 100 possible 
but it, yeah you know it's it's a challenge and I think approaching it with a bit of self-compassion if people do want to quit it is is the way forward how was your sort of approach towards Port now then to be honest these days it doesn't really have much of a a kind of it, it it doesn't really form a central part of my life anymore I think when I was a teenager I think it was very easy um also like I mentioned in the article how we were that kind of first generation that had easy access to online porn and I think once I'd kind of discovered it uh which was by accident well it was it's by accident, but if it hadn't been the way I did, it would have been another way, it would have been a friend or whatever. Um, it sort of, yeah, formed the center of everything. I mean, we were all joking about it at school and talking about it at school. And and then that was probably the case until university. And then it was with the first couple of like proper relationships I had um, when I sort of, naturally stopped using it i suppose um and nowadays i it's probably you know a couple of times a week tops whereas back then it would have been easily every day you know um and it's sort of it's no longer this sort of um yeah it doesn't have a hold over me like it did back then um but i think that really just came out of quite naturally i it was no, it wasn't something that i said I need to do this or I need to use this less or I need to do that. It's just happened naturally. Um, and yeah. I think that's, like I said in the article, I, I'm i not sort of anti-porn. Uh, I do think it's going to exist. I think it's, I think there should be much better regulation around it, definitely. Um, but it's kind of just sort of become a more healthy or as, as healthy a relationship as it can be. Um, so yeah that's kind of where it sits with me now yeah yeah so it kind of sounds like you don't really think about it much whereas when you were younger you yeah. know, it'd just be kind of there in your life as something that you'd laugh and joke about with your friends and you'd probably consume it more because you're a horny teenager yeah. right no absolutely yeah I mean there's a one of my favorite novels is um Metroland by Julian Barnes which is written in in the 80s um so it's like but he talks about like uh young men just like constantly having hard-ons just at the thought of a certain thought or something it's like you're at school and just have, it's like I think when you combine that it's one thing when what you're going to do with it back in the 60s he's writing about it's like well you might find a porn mag or you might whatever whereas for my generation our generation it was just like well <laughs> I've got I got even now like it terrifies me that the sort of smartphone revolution has made that so much easier because we had I think I had Blackberry at that point, um, if this is sort of the iPhone was in its infancy and it was still a bit crap uh, compared to today's phones, but like to have that just on tap essentially now would be terrifying. Um, I was, I and we and were heavily limited by the fact that we had a computer, a massive computer in a in a kind of uh, in a hallway of my family's house, and the internet was. In the early days, it was dial up, and then when broadband did come around, it was still pretty crap. Um, so that always, that sort of terrifies me now. Um, uh, what would I have been different if I was a thirteen year old today? Probably, I guess. Um, but fortunately, I wasn't. And I'm not, and um, yeah, it just kind of naturally sort of faded away that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of scary to think how accessible it is nowadays. And if you were to like grow up with it now and you've got even like TikTok, I mean, there's so much like sexually provocative content on the app and that app does seem to be targeted at quite a lot of young people in particular. Mm. Like they, they seem to be on the app. And so, you know, even though it's not a porn app, really it's sort of going to have some of the same sort of impacts on the brain as porn if you're just like scrolling and seeking sort mm. of these big dopamine sort of hits and you know getting pleasure from a screen essentially you're kind of relaying yeah. orgasm with a screen but yeah, yeah that that story that you were talking about then you know uh you've grown up and you've got like a yeah like a computer in your house I remember mm. I've never shared this before with anybody but I'll, I'll do it now because I want to kind of follow <laughs> in, I want to follow in your footsteps and being as honest <laughs> as possible and just sharing an embarrassing story but uh, go for it 
Oh yeah, this is a bad one. So <laughs> I think I was about <laughs> I think I was probably like 13. So probably just like a year into discovering any sexual content. I don't think it actually got into like porn yet, but it was just like going mm-hmm. on Google Images and it was like a woman in a bra with like massive boots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so yeah, I of ended course. up like <laughs> yeah. So I ended up finding like a photo of this woman and I'm in my front room like where the TV is and, and everything and I don't know what possessed me but I ended up yeah it started to masturbate and then like oh this is horrible but I think my mum like came in and then like, obviously she's come she's gone straight <laughs> out of the room like she, I think she did like catch me I think that's the only time that's ever happened yeah really. yeah she goes straight out oh, of the room yeah. I'm like 13 and then like, I, I close the laptop I'm panicking I'm like oh no no <laughs> <laughs> so, like I go like I, I just thought I'd face it, and I was like, "Mom, did you want something?" And she's like, "No, no, no, like no." And I, so like she completely pretended as if she hadn't seen anything. And she like accidentally opened this room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But she def she definitely would have like probably caught me really. Um, yeah, yeah. I've I've never shared that with anyone. Oh god. So embarrassing. Well, the thing that I, it's like it, it is I. I everyone's got a story like that though. that's what's so funny about it I, I think I always think of that scene with, in, again going back to the in-between as a Jay wearing like the uh, snorkeling mask yeah that scene I think is it in the movie or yeah, or it's in the movie, but, yeah, yeah. and I just I just I, I that is just so funny I mean I fortunately to me that's never happened although um when um, the article went out and my mum and dad read it of course and um my mum made this horrible joke about um I used to, because there's a bit where I talk about using the computer in the hallway and like listening out for my mum's keys. And then uh, my mum made this joke, like, I used to jingle them and take as long as I could just so, <laughs> just so you could finish <laughs> up. And I was like, oh God, don't say that. I was like, I can make those jokes. I can tell those stories, but coming from oh. your mum is pretty awful. Oh, but um, yeah, it makes me laugh also what you just said there about like using Google images. And it's kind of one of those, I remember like, I, I, I talk about, um, you know, if you put a, a filter on porn, for example, on the home computer, on the internet, you find ways around. And I remember sometimes you wouldn't be able to get access to the internet, so you end up just like Googling just random terms, just hoping for something. Um, oh God, yeah. But I, I, that's the funny thing. I think now it is so embarrassing, but every single person's got those stories. Um, a man, uh, who I, a colleague of mine, um, who I don't know how old he is, but he's sort of um, probably, He's like late 50s, early 60s, and he just came and it's like he's got just as many embarrassing stories, just minus the online porn. And I and I, I found that really sort of heartening. And it sort of makes me feel like that's why I that's why I approached it with humor as well. I think you can go really seriously about this stuff, but a humor is such a good way of going, oh, do you know what? I'm just a normal person. <laughs> it's like who's and doing the same thing as everybody else. And there's some kind of, I don't know, it feels like that's a good thing. I think feeling like you're not alone is a very important thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think like in the past, my biggest problem when it came to this whole porn thing, because this was like a really big problem in my life, but Mm. my biggest problem above anything else, above like maybe the amount I was watching it, because it never really was that much. And Mm -hmm. above maybe like erectile dysfunction, like once or twice, Mm -hmm. and above anything like that, it was definitely just the the way in which I took it so seriously you know for sure that was the most that was the Mm. biggest problem you know if I had have approached it having maybe read like an article like this and realized that there's probably millions of other guys out there who are all having sort of yeah kind of crazy experiences really growing up looking at porn it's like you know what one I'm not alone here two I don't really think it's like my fault and that's kind of what I've come to understand is that actually if you grow up in a certain culture and you have high speed internet pornography on like mm. a smartphone and you know it's pretty much everywhere our brains are kind of designed to crave and want yeah. that stuff and if it's then normalized by the society in which you live in it's like well why wouldn't you so yeah, yeah. and also taken advantage of by those kind of algorithms that you know that we we talk a lot about those algorithms with social media and things you, you mentioned tiktok and uh yeah instagram all of these places just like abuse that dopamine thing porn sites do exactly the same um i mean i'd be interested you mentioned earlier you said you were watching some kind of like stuff that you felt that you were less proud of watching for example 
And I think how I, I would be willing to bet you didn't start there. You know, yeah. you kind of, you end up there because uh, this algorithm eventually sort of brings you there. And that's kind of, I have more of a problem with that than just the sort of the existence of, of, of born in itself. Um, and I, yeah, it's, it is a weird one. Um, I, but you, you mentioned also about taking it seriously. And I think I often wonder, like when I was sort of 14, 15, 16, I used to like play a lot of video games. I had my sort of friends at school that it was based like porn video games and what I now consider quite normal teenage things, right? Um, but now you look at sort of stuff like incel culture and I wonder how that's come about. And I think a lot of that comes from taking yourself too seriously. It's like when I was young, we used to take the piss out of each other so much for this stuff. It's like we were all kind of young men trying to get laid and having no success whatsoever. But instead of being upset about that, it was like you took the piss out of each other. And then you kind of laughed about it and were like, yeah, but this whole group around me are doing exactly the same thing. And then you watch TV and you see the same thing on, in between us and you see things on, you know, it, it's kind of even like Plebs is another one of my favorite shows. It's just like, oh, OK. Whereas that, there just seems to be less of that culture now. Yeah, um, yeah. Like, I don't know. And that's another reason why I was hoping that parents would i mean the times obviously has a certain readership and, and i was hoping that they're gonna bring it to their teenagers and say and just sort of show them because i think it's just it is funny and i i hope that some teenager can read it and be like oh yeah this is really funny and this is me and i see myself in this and actually maybe i don't need to worry too much because ultimately it all kind of works out in the end if, as long as you don't get sort of carried away and and or or that kind of algorithm can cause so much damage and that's a worry i mean that's got to be a worry um as i said earlier i was so limited and i think it would have been quite difficult for for that to happen certainly at the earlier years um but now i can imagine if i was 13 and had that god yeah you get you get pulled away um so it's about taking yourself less seriously definitely and there's stuff you can do but i think also more has to be done to stop under 18s I, I just i'm not i'm not gonna i'm not an activist i'm not a campaigner on this at all but when i was asked oh yeah there's got to be a kind of like a point to this article it can't just be embarrassing stories of yourself i was like okay that's kind of the only thing i can really come on to and i don't know how you can how anyone can really disagree with that you know yeah yeah, um, yeah. no yeah. i completely agree i think i've kind of found the balance between personal responsibility and realizing actually well where has this behavior come from and I've sort of not pinned it on like myself and started to like in the past basically I'd think like oh yeah maybe there's something wrong with me maybe my sexual mm -hmm. desire is out of control mm -hmm. but now it's like no you know what that behavior in the past was kind of just a natural byproduct of the of the society that I've been mm -hmm. brought up in and and yeah, so there's a lot of responsibility at play with with like the government and like people mm. who should really be regulating these sites because I don't think people growing up should have as easy access as they do to yeah. pornography. It, I think it has been, I think there's new regulation in like one state in America, I think I read last year, um, but there's just nowhere near enough. And I think it's also mm. just about like awareness as well because yeah, even if this stuff was regulated better, you're still going to find it. Like there's always a way oh, to find sexual yeah. content. And and mm. that's part of the game sometimes. Like that part of like trying to find that sexual content when you do have like a yeah. blocker. It's pretty exciting. Mm. You know, it is. Yeah. It's kind of fun. As, so, adds something yeah. else to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. It's another mm. it's another layer of um it's almost like you're mixing like gaming in with yeah. something, <laughs> you know, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. but yeah, no, I would I'd love there to be more regulation in the future mm. i think i think what you said about like these incel communities as well is very interesting and i think that may be due to just the way in which we do live in a more disconnected society nowadays where people aren't going and chilling out with each other when i was growing up you know we wouldn't really be on our phones too much we'd we'd mm. actually just go down to like the park or we'd sit in ksc and we'd just have a laugh and talk rubbish for like yeah. a few hours Whereas nowadays, I don't know whether people 
Do you just hang out as casually, quite as often? Like, mm. I don't know what teenagers do, but they seem to be spending a lot of time online and, and self-development, yeah. like YouTubers and stuff as well. I think that plays a big part in taking it all yeah. too serious. I yeah. used to consume I mean, a lot of, like, that kind of content, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a lot of pressure. I, one of the things I often see is, like, these, even if it's things like morning routines or um, uh, lifestyle and wellness, and and I think... I'd like to think a lot of these things are kind of well-meaning, but I, a lot of the time I feel like it's just more pressure. If you wake up and you're supposed to have done this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing by nine o'clock and you haven't, you're going to feel like a failure before the day's even begun. And I think that kind of pressure relates to this topic of, of porn as well, because I think the idea of this somehow perfect life really encapsulates things for a generation that sees a lot more through its phone than perhaps we did um because you start to just like judge yourself against it you compare yourself against this and it's and it's that same thing that you said earlier about like judging yourself for the things that you watched when ultimately you had very little control over that to be honest um there would be lots of people that say oh you could just turn it off but i mean they don't know how things work and um yeah I, I i that's another thing this kind of seriousness just worries me is a strong word uh but i i do kind of feel it's something i don't understand and that kind of i guess it's that lack of understanding that kind of worries me um i've got um four nieces and a nephew and they're what the world's going to be like when they grow up and the pressures that are going to be on them and uh, yeah it's it's that kind of thing does concern me regulation can do something but i also think the culture around us needs to sort of be different the conversations we have need to be different um you need to make fun of i, I personally believe we have to make fun of a lot of the stuff um and then hopefully things well. that's how for me that's how i found a lot of uh, comfort yeah. from just watching other people's embarrassing things i mean i still watch the imaginist today and it cracks me up it doesn't matter how many times i watch it i'm just like oh god that that scene where um will has tries to have sex for the first time with his socks on and he's like pushing off the bed frame is just great and i and that is so much more realistic than than skins for example right <laughs> it's maybe or at least yeah. in my experience i mean maybe there's loads of like people out there that are like no, skins is pretty bang on but uh not for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and i think i think my favorite one is simon when he's just like slapping it why won't yeah. you work 100 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. percent. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> he's like you're there when i don't want you and then you're not there when i absolutely need you <laughs> yeah that is yeah one of the great scenes as well yeah and i, lo I love how jay like before it had told him what he needs to go and do is like have a wank <laughs> And then yeah. you'll be sad. And it's like, no. Yeah, R rub the easy one out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's great. All right. Uh, f final question for you. I think we've only mm. got a few minutes left. Um, sure. I know a lot of my audience are sort of on a journey trying to quit porn for themselves. Mm -hmm. There may be people listening who perhaps think they're addicted to this. And, you know, yeah. I've got like a, a real problem. So, what would be your sort of advice or I don't know if you have any sort God. of tips or anything mm. for anyone who is. Who is trying um, to quit? I don't know. I'm probably the wrong person to ask. <laughs> as, I've, uh, <laughs> as I've never really quit. Um, I, I think I think we've covered it pretty quite well in the sense of just like taking it less seriously. I, I, I think I mean, that sounds kind of condescending in a way. And I, I don't want because I, I, I don't really want it to sound that like that. Um, but I just think, I guess also what you're saying about not blaming yourself mm. I, I guess this is something that is gamed it's for you to lose it's like a casino situation you, you know you're gonna it, there's an algorithm out there that's competing for your time um and i suppose not judging yourself for that has got to be you know we all we've all done it we've all been there i don't believe anyone that says that they haven't um at least tried or dipped into and uh yeah I would say less seriously and try not to be too harsh on yourself. Don't judge yourself, I guess. Yeah, but like yeah. I say, I mean, coming from someone who hasn't quit, so <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure that carries much weight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think 
I think, yeah, I guess an alternative to like be less serious is probably more about like be kinder, be more self compassionate, you know, take it easy mm. on yourself, like have have fun with the journey of trying to quit if you're trying to quit. And uh and I think also yeah. just trying to get to that place where end of the day it's not like a big issue in your life. Like you may look at porn, you know, once or twice a week or whatever, but you know, you can gather straight away that this isn't really an issue for you in your life anymore. Otherwise you wouldn't mm. You wouldn't necessarily be writing about it and be on the front cover of the Times magazine if this was a big issue. And, you know, um, yeah, guess, get yeah. into this place where you can just be a bit more open minded, share your story and feel OK with your relationship. Yeah. To your is, um is a great end goal, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I also I, what you just said there, I think, like, for me, talking about it as well, I suppose. I mean, I know that's such a big cliche these days, but. I think again, talking, having these jokes with my friends, um, and sort of realizing that everyone's kind of doing the same thing, I think is really important, um, as well. Yeah, again, for another cliche, just to finish on a cliche, it's like you're not alone thing, you know, you're not, yeah. it, it, it's tough, I guess. I mean, I know. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I think to get to where I, where I am with things was very, yeah, natural, but, it comes from a lot of talking, a lot of jokes, a lot of whatever. And then eventually I was sort of comfortable with it. You know, it doesn't bother me now. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the same as me, really. Yeah. It's true having those laughs and jokes with my mates first of mm. all. It got me to a place where I started this podcast. So, uh, mm. so, yeah, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Really do appreciate it. No worries time. at all. Yeah. Thank no, you. Thanks for inviting me. It's been great. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. Thanks to anyone watching or listening. And I hope you have an amazing rest of your day.